Hey everyone, today I'll be breaking down these two scenes from my latest Instagram post. Uh, the first scene was from my C4D to UE5 workflow tutorial and the second scene was rendered out in Octane so I'll go over both the lighting setup, the materials, how I did set up the animation so like the fields, effectors and the cloners and any other smaller things along the way. So let's just jump straight in. Okay, so now we're in scene one, C4D. So the background is just an extrusion that's been cloned a bunch. The platform and these uh, frame, like these framed rings and things like that were just modeled using the primitives. And then, you know, you just scale them down and bevel them. The chair model is an imported asset that's, you know, nicely unwrapped and stuff like that. The rug is just a squished down cylinder that has a displacer on it. And then in the displacement, it's got a noise that I've scaled in one direction. I would show you, but I baked it down, unfortunately. But you just have a displacer on a squished down cylinder that's beveled. And then you scale the noise in one of the directions and it kind of creates these wrinkles. So really cool tip in terms of creating rug wrinkles and things like that if you don't want to go into like marvelous or any kind of cloth sim uh the next thing are these kind of shimmering metal cubes or squares that you saw in the final render so this is also a really simple setup if i just go to that ring cloner it's just this cube that has really small dimensions and in the cloner i have mode object and what the object is, is this solid uh, ring that I originally modeled. And what I did was I cloned the cubes along the polygon center of this solid. So if I just hide this, what you need to do is just make sure that your solids do have really nice quads so that if you are distributing along the polygon center, it's like evenly distributed. Uh, and a really good way to do that is honestly just utilizing the remesher here. So I'll just model it out, bevel it, and then chuck it into a remesher, bake that down, uh, and then chuck that into my cloner and distribute my uh, objects that way. So definitely take advantage of the remesher. As for the animation and the effectors, the first effector I added was this random effector. So if I go into it, all I've done is randomize the rotation, which kind of just gives it this nice randomization throughout the sphere, uh, throughout the ring so that there's, so it breaks up the repetition. Uh, the next one was a shader effector. So what this was is I added a shader effector with a animated noise. And this kind of gives it that sort of floating in space, zero gravity feel where when the, when the orbiting sphere is not near it, it's just kind of rotating in space and giving these cool metallic reflections. So what you can do is add a shader and within the shader, I've given it a loop period of five seconds. So my whole thing is 30 seconds. So it'll loop once or twice, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and then I just adjusted the animation speed until I was happy with it. So I, I would play, oh, it actually plays right now. So you'll see, uh, yeah, if I go over here, these little random animations happening is this shader effector and it's perfectly looped. So it just seems really natural and organic. So the next two effectors are what's linked to the orbiting sphere. So this plane effector is controlled by the spherical field, as you can see here. And what this plane effector does is very simple. It just raises up the cubes by five centimeters and then rotates them. So it kind of gives this effect that it's attracting towards the ball. And it's just like animating based on the fall off of the field. So really simple um, kind of effect that just uses one effector. And then if I hit play, you'll notice that the cloners kind of still have a bit of undulation and spring to them. So that's what the delay effector is doing. It's just springing these cloners once they finish the overlap of the spherical field. 
Uh, as for the sphere or this orbiting ball, uh, it's animated using an align to spline. So at frame zero, it's at 0% and at frame 300, which is 10 seconds, it's at 100%. So I just keyframe those two spots. Uh, so that's really simple as well. So that's pretty much it for the C4D section. Now I'm gonna go into Unreal Engine 5 and go over the materials and the lighting. So as for the materials, I have this base material that I've set up here. I can make a tutorial on this as well if anyone's interested. And then I instance out that material. That gives me control over all these parameter values. So really all I've done is I've inputted a custom roughness map that kind of gives it this brushed aluminium look here. And then I've made a few different variations like for the platform, the ring and the other platform. And I just played with, you know, the metallic amount and the roughness amount. As for the fabric material, all I've done is gone into the marketplace and use the fabric materials PBR pack. I added it to my project, uh, as you can see here. And then if I go into one of them, I've just sort of played around with the different values to get the look I want. And you can see it's really good at like giving that nice fabricy soft fall off and have that um, sort of fuzzy fall off towards the edges of the objects as well. So really simple material setup, only like five different materials in this scene uh, and they're all quite easy to make. So for the lighting setup, uh, I'll start with these light panels. You can see I just have three light panels that, uh, that help just highlight the background a bit more and give that nice highlight towards the edges of the extrusions. Uh, you can definitely achieve these sort of soft fill looks with rectangular lights, but out of the box, I just find the light panels work a bit better, especially for these sorts of scenarios. So that's why I chose to use them. The next light is this rectangular light that I've animated in the scene. Uh, the reason I animated it was just because it kind of highlighted the materials quite well and, you know, gave some dynamic reflections during the animation uh, and then just lit up the whole scene in general for the pathway and the rings itself. And then the next light is a spotlight which sort of just sort of just focuses on the seating and gives those nice, you know, shadow projections on the uh, extrusion that it's sitting on. So that's the whole uh, setup for this scene. Just a bunch of maybe five lights and a couple materials. Uh, very simple, sort of went with the less is more uh, method for this one and trying to do that more in a lot of my other scenes. Uh, let's jump into scene two now. Okay, so now we're in scene two. Very similar uh, scene conceptually to the first one. Uh, I just have this backdrop with a curved corner. Uh, these are some imported assets and these are my animated assets. So for this animation uh, part, I, oh, I just started off with this cube that I scaled up and then I cut out a hole using a cylinder and the boolean. And then I just cloned that uh, across uh, a distance using the linear mode. Uh, as for the scaling, I've got this plane effector which scales it in the Z direction to negative 0.95 and then I have a delay similar to the last one except I use a blend instead of a spring and then played with the strength and then these uh, effectors are driven by this box field that is a child of this sphere. So the sphere is animated using the same align to spline and then keyframing the position. And then I've made this box uh, field a child of the sphere so that it follows it around and you can see how the fall off works and all of that sort of stuff. The rod or this pipe uh, is just, I got a rectangle uh, object and then chamfered the corners. So can I... If I just solo this. Yep, so this from the top view, it was a rectangle. I made it editable and then chamfered the corners to my liking. I then put it in a sweep and then got a circle at two centimeter radius. And then now my sphere, which was originally a sphere. And you can see, I just have a cutout using a boolean and then 
uh, baked that down just so it was easier for scene organization. So I just have this sphere that is now animating along uh, this rectangle. So the same concept is used for the cable. I just have this spline that I manually drew out uh, using the pen uh, or the spline pen tool. And then I just chucked it in a sweep with a circle, uh, with a circle radius of 0.25 and that was it. And then in the different views, I kind of just positioned it on the floor so I could art direct it how I liked and choose where I want it to loop back into the camera view and things like that. Okay, so for the Octane setup, if I just go to my viewport here, you just see I have three uh, lights. So this first light, let me actually just turn them off. So the first light I ch chose to use was this small uh, key light that I made a disc. So it's an area light in the shape of a disc. And then I kind of just obviously turned down the size or reduced the radius of it just to get those sharper shadows like you see here and then increase the power and left the temperature on neutral actually. Uh, the next light was, as you can see, just kind of a very warm but soft fill light on the back here, really just to help light, uh, give some light to these objects on this face here as well as a bit on the left of the sofa. And then last but not least, which I think kind of carries the whole image, to be honest, is this background light that I have pointing at the wall, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then I just have it set to a really low temperature to make it super warm. And by the way, before I forget, all these lights have a octane uh, fall off map gradient on it, just to have a bit more of a natural fall off. Uh, but yeah, so I just have this background light shining and then I played around with the rotation just to get the right amount of uh, oranginess to non-oranginess on the left, just playing with the gradient fall off really. As for the materials, also very simple. I'll just go over these two main materials as the rest are just like plain materials with some noise maps in the bump. So the first blue material you see here is just a simple subsurface scattering random walk material and I just plugged in a couple colors that are at very different such like very subtle I should say uh, saturation levels for the albedo and radius and then you just play with the density until you like it so it kind of gives it this nice soft almost rubbery feel and I love how it plays with the beveled edges and just the sort of really subtle fall off it gives on the corners of the object. The next material here is the sofa. So it's also really simple. I just use a fall off map and a couple mixed texture nodes to play with the different levels of gray in the sofa. And that is driven by this uh, kind of suede mask map that goes into a color correction. And then I mix it with the two colors here, like I mentioned, and then that mix goes into another mix that's controlled by the fall off map, just to give it that fuzzy, uh, soft textury feel. And lastly, the render settings for the animation. So my max samples are at 512 and then 8812 for the uh, depth parameters and then GI clamp at 10. And then I had adaptive sampling turned on with a minimum samples of 64 with a pretty high noise threshold. But because I have the denoiser enabled, in my camera imager, I have my spectral AI denoiser enabled. Make sure you have it on static noise so that if you're doing an animation, there's no flickering. And then you can see it takes roughly about a minute a frame, a little over a minute, which is pretty good. And then what I actually did was render out the animation with a frame step of two, which you can see here. And then I used an AI uh, app called Flow Frames and I chucked in 150 frames, interpret, like put it on times two, and then it spit out 300 frames, which then became a perfect 10 second video. I can make a full separate video on this, but this saves me so much time. Uh, shout out New Plastic for introducing me to this workflow. Uh, and it's super efficient. And it only took, I think for 10 seconds, it took about two hours at a, uh, resolution of 2000 by 2500 which is not bad at all 
on a single GPU. Another thing I ran into, which is more of a question from my end, was this would show 109 in the live viewer, but in the picture viewer, it would sometimes be 1 minute 30 or 1 minute 40 even. Uh, I don't know why there's such a large discrepancy between the live viewer and the picture viewer. So if anyone knows, it might be the post effects or something. I'm not really sure, but if anyone knows, uh, let me know in the comments below just so I can kind of get that fixed. Uh, just to have a better estimate of how long the render will take. So hopefully, my light's just gone out by the way. Uh, hopefully uh, you learned something from that video that pretty much concludes everything. If you have any questions, feel free to comment them down below or DM me on Instagram and chuck me a follow. Uh, if you have any constructive criticism or tips on Octane and Cinema 4D, please let me know because I'm coming from Redshift so I'm really just trying to get a lot better at Octane. Uh, and that pretty much is it, I think. So have a good one and peace. I'll catch you in the next one.